We also have two elected officials today who are not officially a part of the panels, and I want to just acknowledge that they're willing to put their time and energy to be here, Representative Chuck Eisenhart and Representative Kurt Hansen, if you wouldn't mind standing, and we'll thank you for taking your time and energy to participate. Um, one of the things that was interesting, a lot of talk in the previous panel about land use, and we have um, Chuck Connerly, who is here today, who's the director of our school, school of Urban Regional Planning, and he did a real interesting study about that issue in Iowa City, as was kind of pointed to, and that the city of Iowa City, and I might have these dates slightly off, but was built around the 1840s and 50s, and so when the university was developed and they wanted to expand the ability as was mentioned, uh, the old capital and everything were up on the bluff, you couldn't actually move east even as early as around the 1900s. And everything from there was going down into the floodplain. And that was no different than now. We don't like to put in public dollars into things. That was the cheapest land. There were reports that said don't build down there, but that was where we ended up expanding. And so and then you have a lot of the university buildings around the Union and some of those that you're aware of that flooded badly, and that goes way back to policy decisions 100 years ago. And so these aren't things that we're just doing now. These are things that have obviously been going on for a long time. Um, our next panel is going to be about agricultural issues, obviously of great interest in the state of Iowa and largely affected by these extreme weather patterns. Um, our first speaker we're very fortunate to have with is Bill Northey, uh, the Secretary of Agriculture from the state of Iowa. Uh, Secretary Northey participated in a symposium we did in the spring on the fifth anniversary of the floods. And one thing we've also been blamed when we have these symposiums is actually causing things. So. <laughs> Uh, we did one on the subprime mortgage, mortgage crisis in the fall of 2008, right as everything crashed. So we were getting blamed for that. This spring, we were coming off the drought. How could we possibly have flood? We literally had water coming up to the door of the Czech Museum in Cedar Rapids, and it looked like the night before part of the city was going to be shut down, and we may not have been able to get there. Today, we've obviously, knowing we did this in December, we were a little worried, but everything's looked clear, look clear, and then all of a sudden yesterday we get these extreme weather warnings. So um, we appreciate Secretary Norther joining us again and giving us an overview on the agricultural issues. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, maybe we should have talked about warming in December. That might have helped us, but uh, certainly my pleasure to be able to be with you here and speak a few minutes about uh, agriculture. You certainly heard some of the conversation in the last panel as well. Um, obviously, with the scale of agriculture in this state, there's a huge impact. A huge impact economically when things change, huge impact off the farm as well, certainly when we have the weather extremes uh, as well. Um, so, so I think you'd either have to be new to Iowa or really, really into whatever you're doing to have missed the fact that, that we've had some impact the last few years um, from those weather extremes on agriculture. Um, and that impacts the rest of the state as well, because when we produce things here, uh, we have a lot of folks that do things with those things that we produce. Uh, so if we affect crop production and we don't have as much crop production, um, then we don't have as much crop production that can go into some of the livestock production, the further processing that happens, certainly the income that helps a lot of other things that seem sometimes not very agricultural, helps some of those things go. Uh, you look at this last spring, um, again, as was, was mentioned, we we're coming off a drought year. Uh, our concern going in, into this last spring was whether we we're going to get enough rain to be able to have a crop grow into July and August, and of course we just got buried. We had the most rain in May and June that we've had in recorded weather records back 140 years. Um, we ended up with about a half a billion dollars worth of crop that did not get planted. Um, in our recent memories, uh, although as you look back, there's a lot of extremes through the time we've been farming in Iowa, but in our recent memories, we've not seen that before. Um, it certainly was an impact, and then of course we turned dry. Um, and uh, we ended up still having some trouble in some parts of the state, being able to have enough moisture to finish our crops uh, as well, and so that in impacted crop production. Um, coming off a year ago, uh, with the extremes of dry weather all the way through the year. We actually went into that year with very good spring moisture um, and ended up uh, certainly very, very dry last year. Now, many of the folks in agriculture look at the 
extremes we've suffered the last couple of years and say that 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 the the response to that uh, the crops and and the seed that we're using and the methods we're using to take care of it um, allowed amazing productivity even though less than what we would have hoped for amazing productivity uh, compared to maybe some of our past systems and some of the other things that we've done uh, so so there are pieces that have gone into that and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, but but as you look back you see models of some years like this and in fact Harry Hilliker is our, our state climatologist he works in our office uh, and he was coming back up with a parallel to last year it was 1947 um, actually it was was just as wet early it was wetter going into the year um, and then it was hotter and drier after and later summer certainly a a bad production year um, and so I would say while agriculture is experiencing some real extremes now you look back over time and we've always experienced extremes um, and 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 I have no way of gauging more or less I'm just saying they're all different and and every farmer will say there is no average year uh, we all experience amazing changes uh, in fact I just actually came across a um, a publication from 1937 and it was it was talking about different facts in mostly non-ag but certainly weather facts here as well and uh, this was uh, from 19, uh, 1937 on to the what would it have been about the 1880s uh, or 1870s when when the weather record started I talked about the difference in moisture. The wettest year was 1881 with 44 inches. The driest year was, was 1910 uh, with just under 20 inches. And so you see a big extreme there and locations would see way greater extremes. This is statewide average. Way greater extremes locally. Uh, so we end up seeing significant extremes just like we've experienced recently. Um, it, it does seem like that we have more moisture as you look at the numbers here the average at that time was 31 and a half inches uh, over those 63 years uh, 64 years of weather records um, we're closer to that 35 36 inches and somebody probably here knows what that what that number is now that has a big impact when we look at a difference between the extremes of 20 inches and 44 inches or we look at an average going from 31 to, to 36 inches, um, we're talking about more than just that percentage increase in impact either on the farm or off the farm. Uh, when we see a 50% increase in moisture, which is a bunch, but you see a 50% increase in moisture, you see a 200% increase in runoff because the soil fills up and there's not enough room for it and therefore the excess has to go someplace uh, and so you see significant impacts to our streams uh, that happen uh, certainly as flooding was talked about it certainly is can be very concerning to the impact of those street those river beds and river uh, banks as well and and the flows and and others have talked and are much more conversant and, and educated about how to be able to understand what those impacts are but those have significant impacts off that farm um, into what kind of water we're trying to run down these streams that in some cases probably uh, didn't normally see this kind of water um, and and others will talk about why that's happening certainly we believe uh, that that there has always been these these uh, 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 water's moving whether whether tile lines are a part of this whether runoffs a part of it whether land use changes are a part of it the issues certainly are there for us to be able to try and understand and mitigate and figure out what's happening and what the future impact is I'd say from an agricultural perspective um, there's a lot less conversation about what's making this all happen a lot more conversation about what do we do about it uh, there is real impact um, farmers certainly spend time trying to figure out how to do different things on the farm to mitigate that impact there is conversation about cover crops a lot of our conservation practices about moving water and water moves and and it moves in our urban areas just like a rural areas it's just that we have a lot more urban area or a lot more rural areas than we do urban areas we have 23 million acres of cropland we have 31 million acres in farms uh, we have a few hundred thousand acres of urban areas we need to look at all those pieces to be able to figure out how do we manage that water that's moving 
and water moves when it does it causes all kinds of issues it causes nutrient issues we we move in fact there's there's an argument that much of our nutrient issues around nitrogen and phosphorus are more about transport than they actually are about loading now they're probably about both but we have very nutrient rich soils uh, nitrogen within that organic matter that's been built over over you know all of history to be able to create a soil that's very productive um, and allows us to produce crops that allows us to store moisture for those times that are dry it's very unique here versus other places that organic matter is very important to us that organic matter can denitrify can mineralize and can leave that farm as well get transported off that farm um, certainly fertilizer can as well organic matter from the previous year's crop um, so so there is a certainly a part of a nutrient strategy that must understand how water moves and how water moves these nutrients. Obviously on phosphorus we're talking about soil erosion, so we're talking, you know, very dedicated to water movement causing issues. Um, several different strategies out there. We've had a cost share program in the state of Iowa since the 70s. Obviously there have been federal cost share programs since the 30s. Uh, to pay part of the cost of putting practices on farms. Grass waterways, terraces, you know, it seemed like we'd be done by now, right? Well, there's a lot of farms, a lot of places, and in fact, might be an argument that, that, that the challenges are even greater if we're having more moisture uh, than what they once were. So the engineering, the general engineering of these practices um, is done not around 100-year events that can withstand the kinds of springs that we just saw. They're around something that's much more cost-effective and works, you know, 99% of the time, but doesn't work all the time. Um, and as we bulk those up, there's more that needs to be done. Uh, so we need practices. We need more practices. We certainly see more practices. There's been this ongoing argument of have we seen some of those practices come off the ground uh, with high priced grain that's out there. Um, I think everybody can find something out there, but for the vast majority of the time, we've actually seen a lot of folks lined up to put new practices. We get $7 million a year that usually buys about $20 million worth of new practices, conservation practices on the farm every year. We actually have $20 million worth of applications, so that's over $50 million worth of conservation practices that farmers want to put on the land that are signed up, ready to go when that cost share comes. Increasing the, increasingly, some of them are, are actually putting them on without any cost share at all or using some low interest loans that we have, a state revolving fund. Um, so we, have, we certainly have folks not dropping off that list. We have folks wanting to increase um, their effort in those practices. Let me mention uh, cover crops as well. Um, cover crops has been used by some folks for a long time. We have a very, very small amount of cover crops that are out there, uh, but we're seeing rapid adoption in from a very, very small base. Um, a lot of interest, um, as was mentioned, we had a cover crop program within the Water Quality Initiative this year. We had 100, 000, or we had 1,100 farmers signed up for a, over 100,000 acres of cover crops. And these are farmers that had not had cover crops on their farmland before. We think um, we don't have great numbers. We don't have a, uh, the federal folks are starting to, a reporting system um, on how many acres of cover crops we have. But, but we believe we about doubled the number of cover crops. That's on top of more than doubling it um, probably each of the last few years as well. And I think we're seeing that interest that will cause folks to be able to figure out this is this is good water quality practice it's good erosion control practice if you have uh, livestock this is a good practice to produce some forage at other times there's there's weed control benefits as well and i believe we're getting to the point where we're seeing folks and we already obviously have many folks that that without the benefit of any cost share, and we don't intend to continue to cost share these practices to folks, we intend to encourage folks to try them to start with. But without the benefit of ongoing cover or cost share, we see folks adopting these practices. Um, these are good on many levels. Um, I think it's, it's so obviously good, we get it, the ground should be covered up, 
and should have something growing on it from last fall until the crop goes in this spring. Uh, it's not right for that to be open. And if we can find ways to keep that cover, make it efficient, uh, and a return to producers, then that's an important thing for us to do. I know I'm, I see the time. I'm running short on time, but uh, um, let me talk just consequentially. Certainly the billions of dollars that we have in agricultural production. Uh, we have about $30 billion last year in agricultural production. About just short of 20 billion of that was crop. Uh, so, um, and 10 billion of livestock production that's certainly impacted by crops. We saw the, uh, the drought, the weather problems here and in other places have a big impact on those prices. Uh, we've talked about, I think it was mentioned earlier too, $7 corn that came about. That's a huge impact to folks um, on the farm, uh, certainly buying that grain. Um, it certainly is an impact to those that are selling it. Um, we've seen that. Uh, that's very different now. If, if you haven't been a part of a grain market for, for several months, you realize that we're now talking $4 corn rather than $7 corn. Um, that's a different number. That'll change some of the incentives. Um, that certainly is something that uh, many fo more folks can live with. There are considerations that there are significant impacts off the farm. In fact, there was a lot of concern uh, that, that the drought and these weather impacts here and other places were having an impact on inflation in other places, food inflation. Now, of course, we just saw corn go from $7 down to $4. We'll still have increase in food inflation. Uh, this next year, in spite of that, you would think that we'd have the reverse of that if corn was causing all of it. Uh, but there are impacts not only here and in other places. Talk about farmers doing different practices, certainly covers or a, a, a residue from last year's crop, uh, more no-till, uh, more reduced tillage. Uh, the, the cover crop pieces, certainly more conservation practices. We Iowa has more buffers. Uh, CRP buffers than any other state. So there's a lot of pieces out there where farmers are adopting these pieces. And I think we'll, when we get to questions, we'll have some time uh, to be able to talk about that. And I'm sure the rest of the panel will share some of those things as well. Thank you all. So our first panelist is Rick Cruz. He's a professor of agronomy and director of, Iowa, at the, of the Iowa Water Center at Iowa State University. And he's going to be talking about maintaining soil resources and the impact that extreme weather has on that. And Rick also <laughs> participated in our flood symposium in the spring. So welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Soils, <clears throat> excuse me, are the foundation for one of the most important economic pillars in the state of Iowa. That's its crop production. The importance of this economic pillar is going to increase. Soils are our first line of defense against flooding. They absorb rainfall. They store. They release much slower than runoff. Soils are also extremely vulnerable to degradation, especially soil erosion, if they're not properly managed. Uh, Mark Nearing has indicated uh, through an analysis that as rainfall intensity increases, soil erosion increases by a factor of 1.6. Why, why will Iowa's productivity become more important? Uh, Brian Keating, University of California Davis, has done an analysis in which he, based on population rise and increasing standard of living across the globe, we will need to produce in the next 50 years more food than we have produced since basically the dawn of civilization. This is occurring while we are losing agricultural ground. Uh, USDA estimates that uh, in the 25 year, year period from 1982 to 2007, we have converted 41 million of agricultural acres in the U.S. to non-ag uses. Of that, 14 million is far prime farmland, that that we see outside Des Moines, outside of Ankeny, outside of Iowa City, outside of Ames. That type of thing makes me, as a former farm boy, turn in my grave, basically, if I was there. <laughs> okay, because once it's lost, it ain't coming back. Is that only in the U.S.? No, not at all. FAO estimates that in the next 17 years, we will lose 7% of the world's agricultural land. The additional two billion people need a place to live. Do the math, 7% of today's current agricultural land area just about equates to the potential agricultural expansion that is existing in Brazil. 
We are losing, we are losing egg ground in ways that we probably have an opportunity to reduce that loss. And again, when it's gone, it's gone. We can't return it. So how much are we actually losing? This is via erosion. That's a diagram from the Iowa Daily Erosion Project. Color-coded map of the state of Iowa that indicates estimated soil erosion losses for the year 2007. 2007 was selected because that's the last time we had a statewide estimate by the USDA. Color codes range from uh, the greens, zero to five tons per acre, up to the maximum you'll see estimations between 50 and 100 tons eroded in that single year. Six million acres in the state of Iowa, that's roughly uh, about 25% of the corn and bean acres in the state, eroded at rates estimated at greater than 10 tons per acre in 2007. Understand these estimates, if you remember the previous slide, you saw those ephemeral gullies, those channels, the things that you could see from the roads, do not, do not include soils that move in those venues. This is only sheet and real erosion. Further, the gold standard that we've been using in terms of what we can tolerate for soil erosion, that amount of soil erosion that will allow us to maintain soil productivity indefinitely has been five tons per acre per year. That was developed and given to us in 1941. Most recent research indicates our soil development rates are not five tons per acre per year, but are closer to one half ton per acre per year. The point, our soil erosion rates are greater because of our conservative method of estimates, the universal soil loss equation, the WEP erosion that we use in the Iowa Daily Erosion Project, and the impact of the soil that we're losing is greater than what we once thought. So why is this important? From the egg landscape, uh, we've got curves from two different soil types in Iowa, lost the western soils, the till derived soils uh, in central Iowa. What happens as uh, you see the corn yield on the vertical axis, topsoil depth on the horizontal axis, what happens to corn yield as the so topsoil thins? Yields go down. What happens to topsoil depth when erosion proceeds? gets thinner. So why do yields continue to go up? Why do we still increase our life expectancy in this country even though obesity is increasing? Okay, there's a variety of factors going to longevity, there's a variety of factors that go into corn yield increases. One of those is technology. One of those is the genetics improvements that we've seen has been alluded to in the past. We need technology to make to, to, to handle some of the, the issues that we're developing, the needs to improve crop productivity, can we, with technology, overcome our soil erosion issue? Let's use another analogy. You take Formula One, put it on the Indianapolis Speedway, what do you get? You get performance, take that same Formula One, you put it on a grade B road that's unmaintained, and what do you get? Take a billion dollar genetics package, Put it on degraded lands that can either supply the quantity of water or nutrients that you're needed, what do you get? Technology is a great tool. Technology is not our, going to be our saving salvation if we don't have the base upon which we need to get the materials necessary to make it perform. Step outside the egg issue to off-site issues. This does not appear in the literature. If I were to put one ton of soil here on the floor and I were to add water to it, I could add 93 gallons before the pore space would be saturated. If we take one ton of soil off of one section of land, remove it from the uplands, remember this is a sponge. This is what's holding water against runoff. If we take five tons per acre per year off of one section, move it into the floodplains, move it into reservoirs. We are basically trimming the sponge that we use on the Iowa landscape to hold water against runoff, against our flooding issues. If you take one section of land, zoom 93 acres per, uh, per ton, 93 gallons per ton is lost, it reduces our potential storage in that one section by 300,000 gallons of water. 
What does that mean in terms of quantity? If you look at the USGS information for last week, Des Moines River was running at 193 cubic feet per second. What we lost in storage in five tons per acre over one section would require three and a half minutes of water flow through the Des Moines River last week to equate to the lost storage capacity. Understand if you lose five tons per acre, you're thinning that sponge. What you lose this year, it doesn't come back. Once it's gone, it's gone. I contend, now this is not science yet, we're going to work on this, that our the loss of uh, soil has had greater flooding implications than has draining of our wetlands. I think erosion linked with upland water storage loss and extreme events is something that we need to consider and consider heavily. Policy was asked to say something about policy, asking an ivory tower farm want to, farmer want to be to talk about policy is synonymous to asking a Missouri mule to build a textbook for a college algebra class. <laughs> Having said that, I think there's a couple of things that need to be, 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 be addressed. One is our tolerable soil loss standard of five tons per acre per year, which was established in the 1940s, no longer is credible. We know that we cannot maintain sustainability. We cannot farm the way we've been and, and expected in perpetuity, perpetuity, whatever that word is, because <laughs> we're not developing at that rate. <coughs> Our gold standard for estimating soil erosion, the revised universal soil loss equation, the water erosion prediction project model that we use in the Iowa Daily Erosion Project, ignores, does not account for the, the, the soil that's lost in those ephemeral gullies. Our erosion estimates that we're relaying to the public that we're using for farm planning, that we're using for cost share, for cross compliance, are incredibly conservative. We're basically enabling risky behavior. And now we're looking at elevated precipitation events coming down the road towards us. If I want to put those in one nutshell and one statement, it would be this, that our current policies are tied to misrepresentation of soil erosion. And sustainability claims that simply cannot be defended. We're using old science and weak science to make claims that simply, I think, are not valid. In light of climate extremes, I think Iowa's production is going to be increasingly important. Dryland agriculture production, we have a competitive advantage if we have the resource base to make us do, to allow us to do what we potentially can, can do, what can be done. I think our production potential is being reduced through land degradation, through erosion. Consider erosion as a yield drag. It's a yield drag you can't get rid of. Once you've lost it, it's not coming back. If you use a herbicide that gives you a yield drag, what can you do? You can change herbicides. But if you lost soil, if you, you thinned your topsoil, that drag is with you every subsequent year. I think degradation is going to continue and the forces causing degradation, the precipitation, are very likely to increase. Land degradation is limiting technology. I use corn, or corn hybrids or genetic potential. It's limiting the ability for those to perform. I think our off-site erosion Economic impacts are likely greater than we suspect. In fact, as I think they are much greater than we suspect. And I'll leave you with a picture from north central Iowa, an area that is uh, well known to be quite unerosive. But I think any farmer in this audience could take a look at the color of that soil and draw you yield maps relative to impacts associated with prior erosion processes. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Our next speaker is Jacqueline Comito. She's a program manager at the Iowa Learning Farms and director of Water Rocks. And she's going to be talking about uh, a different kind of a regular, not really, I don't know if we say regulatory, but a policy making issue with the Soil and Water Commissions. And since I'm a social scientist, I, d I don't have any slides. In fact, I'm an anthropologist, so I especially don't have any slides. 
You know, one of the things, I'm, before I start, I'm, I'm just going to encourage that uh, rather than just have one social scientist up here speaking in a day, you actually do a whole symposium that has a bunch of social scientists because if we're going to tackle these problems, we actually understand the technical side of this pretty well. We do. Even though Rick's talking about faulty science and, and trying to get people to adopt it, to try to get them to change their mind, Rick, is not about the science. It's about the social impact. So we actually need a whole day conference to get all the best social scientists you can get. And I'm not saying I'm one of them, but get them here and let's have a real good discussion with economists, anthropologists, sociologists, um, and behavioralists so that we can understand this better. So I was asked to speak today about um, the soil and water conservation districts. Could you raise your hand if you understand what these are and what they do? Okay, so mo about half of you in the room understand what these are and what they do. Um, they were established in 19, I think it was about 1935 is when the national federal law was put in place uh, that established the SCS, uh, the State Conservation Society, which then became the National Con or Resources Conservation Service. So in 1939, then they said, you know what, this really has to be on a local level because, and this is going to be a surprise to all of you, landowners, farmers, are suspicious of the federal government. <laughs> Raise your hand if you did not know that. <laughs> okay. So farmers are suspicious of the federal government, so a local representative needs to actually be handling the conservation issues because they will be more trusted. Right, Bill? You trust the local bit more than you do the feds. Absolutely. Even Bill does. Even more than the state. And even more than the state. <laughs> okay. So, um, so they, 1939, then they put in the st statute that would establish these local conservation districts. In Iowa, um, as we like to be first in a lot of things, we are, I think, one of the first states to actually get these on the ground. So in, um, the first one was formed in 1940, and between 1940 and 1952, all 100 soil and water conservation districts. Now, there are 100. We have 99 counties, right? There's one county that was so large it needed two. Um, and so it breaks down into 100 soil and water conservation districts um, that are represented by five commissioners who are elected officials. Now, if you ask the commissioners, they're going to tell you they're volunteers because they're not paid to do their jobs, but they are elected officials which, with legal responsibilities. Um, and that's actually an important thing to note as we go forward to talk about this system a little bit. They are bureaucrats, even though they don't like to see themselves as bureaucrats. They are an arm of both the federal and the state government in order to distribute funds. Um, and they have, they have several different specific powers that a lot of them don't even realize that they have the ability to do. So I'm actually here to answer the question is, is this system, um, it was, are they prepared to respond to extreme weather? But I would say, are they able currently to respond to extreme weather? And um, I'll just make it real easy on you guys. No. And I could sit down and in, in my conversation, but I have a feeling you're going to want to know more details. No, they're, they're not really uh, ready or able at this point to respond for several reasons. Um, as, as Rick was talking about the fact that it was a, that the, the soil equation that we're using to measure erosion is out of date. I think the way we are locally trying to manage um, watersheds and water quality and respond to both quantity and quality of water, which is whether you ask the average soil and water commissioner if their job is flooding too, and they'd probably tell you, no, probably not. Um, there is a lack of understanding of even what their job is. Um, so it's a system that was built when the state looked a lot different. Remember, we went back there, 1940. Well, in 1940, if I looked at the demographics of the state of Iowa, I doubt that I would find the bulk, the majority of our population sitting in our 10 major urban centers. Um, and then if you extend into those communities that are 10,000 or larger, then the heart of our population now is in our urban areas. Our rural population has decreased significantly. It's probably one of the greatest challenges that we face in the state, whether we're talking about um, soil water or soil erosion, water quality, any of those services that needs to be done by the rural level is challenged because we just don't have the human resources. So that's the number one, that's the first reason why um, this system isn't totally prepared to respond to these things. They just literally don't have the people. I, how many commissioners do I have in the room? Raise your hand. I got Irv. Well, Irv can tell you, even in Story County that has a 
decent population base. They are hard pressed to get people who are willing to run for those positions. So let me give you some demographics about the commissioners. And this comes from, I have spent years uh, conducting social research on all of the stakeholders when it comes to water quality in the state, from the soil and water commissioners, to the NRCS staff, to the DNR staff, to um, Iowa State Extension, I've, and to primarily to farmers. So l let me give you a little bit of the demographics as, as we understand it. Um, the average age of the commissioners is 62 years, and that in the ones I listened to, which was about 226 commissioners when I did my listening sessions with them, it ranged from 26, and that was one person, um, to 89. Um, so 62 actually reflects about the average age of farmers today, too. So it's, it's a little bit higher than the average age of farmers. Uh, ni only 19% of them are women, and most of the women are in the uh, urban areas. Um, the average years that they've served is 13, but again, the range there goes from one all the way to 40 years. We do have commissioners who have been commissioners for 40 years. Interestingly enough, the secretaries actually have a lot more um, stability in the system. Their average years has been 19 years. So the secretaries, and when I talk about this, I am, I, I, I am not insulting or, or any one secretary. But our secretaries, if you think they're the stable force with this, they're the non-elected official, they're the person who gets things done, there is no educational requirement or background requirement to hold that job. So if they're the person that are really the first person people meet when they come through the door, their understanding of soil and water, soil health, water quality issues, um, some of them have good knowledge, some of them don't have any knowledge. They're, they're basically just pa doing paperwork. Um, and 75% of our commissioners are farmers or retired farmers. Actually, uh, I think it's about 20% of them are, are, are retired farmers. So if one of their primary jobs is to mitigate soil erosion, but the equation that they're using, like that idea of T, which Rick didn't call it T, but tolerable soil loss, is inaccurate. So then one of the primary things that they're doing is, is mitigating for something that they, they don't totally understand or don't understand the extreme to which, it, uh, which it's happening. Um, last, uh, last January, we gave a presentation on um, this data. Uh, I have actually an article that came out in Human Organization about this, and so we presented that data in a, in a webinar. And it was a record number of attendance on the webinars because word got out that Jackie was going to be speaking about the Soil and Water Commissioners and perhaps not in totally complimentary terms, so everybody was on listening. And when not complimentary terms means I'm just trying to show the barriers to them successfully doing their jobs. Um, we had over 100 people that day and um, a lot more in that week, and I had everybody really, really mad at me. And here's why they were mad at me, is because I pointed out the way the system wasn't working, which is not to criticize any one individual and how hard they are personally working. It's saying the system in general, if we're talking about policy, perhaps needs to be changed, and it needs to be changed in a way that doesn't stress our human resources but still gets the job done. So how do we do that? It's going to take some vision. It's going to take some, it's going to take us really sitting down and deciding that perhaps Iowa doesn't need to be the most governed state in the union. We can maybe have a few less elected officials but have them be a little bit more effective. If you do the math, we have 3 million people, and then you go down all the way to soil and water commissioners, how many elected officials there are per capita in the state. It's really, it's, it's crazy. Iowans, for being as anti-government as they can be at times, we love government. So if we want good people to do these roles, perhaps we have to have a few less of the roles to be done so that we can get the best people in the place. But the biggest reason they criticized me for that presentation is they said, our job isn't to deal with water quality, and you framed all of this about water quality. And so I went, wow, did I really get something that big wrong? So I went and read Iowa Code, and there it was, soil and water quality, soil and water quality. And so one of the first things I'd say, they don't actually understand that their job is to mitigate for water quality. So that's another reason why the system's not ready, because they don't quite totally understand what their job is. Um, Two, they don't understand what kind of power that they have. Um, I could go into the relationship between the NRCS and the Soil and Water Conservation Districts, but that's really complicated and I can't do it now. If you want to understand more about the system, we brought along the report, Water Quality Matters to Us All, 
Uh, and I, we've got copies, so anybody who hasn't read that, I encourage you to read it to get a really good understanding of how these things are seen from a social, psychological perspective, not a technical perspective. It will maybe open your eyes. Um, it might say, wow, the task is, is a lot harder than we think it is. Um, I would say right now, since the nutrient reduction strategy very clearly, the exciting thing for me about that strategy is it said in, in no uncertain terms that one of the largest causes of our water quality challenges is agricultural runoff. It says that in, in no uncertain terms. Um, not every farmer or even soil and water commissioner is convinced of that. So it said that, and that's one of the things we should be saying loud and clear because causes do matter. And so we need to actually state the causes clear so that people are willing to understand how they have to change. Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done. A lot of, of the ways we're going to respond to the nutrient reduction strategy is in the hearts of those districts. So if we're going to talk about policy, at least on that side of it, at least on the water quality side and the flood mitigation, which plays into that, as Rick was saying, then we have got to look at that system and say, how do we make that system work? And I would challenge you to say it's just not about dumping more money into the system. It's about human resources and who's doing those jobs. And, and what do they see as their jobs? If it's just to give out money as bureaucrats, then we're not going to succeed. If it is actually to have a vision for the way the state can look and should look, and that relationship with agriculture, which I think we have to have, and as PR people, then it can do a little bit better. So I will stop there. And our last speaker on this panel is David Miller, the Director of Research at the Iowa Farm Bureau. Um, and as he's coming up here, for those of you who are concerned that we don't have enough about the cause, uh, you can blame John and Joe and I. That was intentional. Um, we wanted this whole session to be more about how do we address the issues that everybody is feeling rather than cause. And a couple of years ago, we did a session, a symposium like this, on climate change when the University of Iowa President Mason was involved with a report coming out of the Fed in Chicago related to that and the impact in the Midwest. But we really wanted this one to be focused on more at who's feeling it, how are we feeling it, what are the economic impacts, and what do we do to that. So you can blame us for that. So I appreciate Mr. Miller being here again. Thank you. Glad to be a part of the program. Um, in addition to uh, being the uh, economist, uh, research director for the Iowa Farm Bureau, I do also farm about 640 acres in south central Iowa. So I get a little bit of real world experience that I can combine with uh, some of this. Uh, one of the same data that you saw in a couple earlier presentations, in fact, uh, this particular chart is one of uh, Chris Anderson's and, and talks about um, a, a little different way to look at what's anomalies. And in this particular one, Chris looked at it, uh, uh, the blue dots represent 1893 to 1980, and the red dots uh, the last 30 years, 33 years. And um, you can see that there's more red dots outside the circle than there are blue dots. Um, and, and that uh, it makes the point that uh, we had the anomalies were one in 20 year events, whether it's dry spring, dry summer, wet spring, wet summer, but outside the circle, if you will. And, and uh, one in four events uh, is outside the circle in the last uh, 33 years. Same data. Uh, but now the red dots are equal to the blue dots. We just divided the data in half. And a couple points I make on that. One is when you do it this way, you find out that we've actually, one of the anomalies that we've got is wet, dry springs, wet summers. Now, the first thing I'd say about a dry spring, wet summer is that makes farmers worry, but it gives big crops. Wet, dry springs, wet summers are not a bad thing, even though they're outside the norm. Uh, because we tend to plant early, um, get the rain when we need the rain, not when the soil's bare, et cetera, those types of things. So not all anomalies are bad anomalies. There can be good anomalies here. Uh, wet spring, wet summer tend to give us all problems. We get the crop in late, 
and then it stays wet and we get nitrogen leaching. Wet spring, wet summer is Bill Stowe's worst nightmare. It doesn't quit. Um, and, and it's the type of year that we just had to a degree. Although we got very dry, this, this calls summer, uh, uh, July, August, and, and it was wet, and then it, like 47, it turned dry, and the good news is it wasn't as bad as 47. Um, dry spring, dry summers, the anomalies are about the same as what we've had in the last 60 years versus the uh, previous uh, 60 years prior to that, and wet spring, dry summers, we don't get a lot of those here in terms of the anomalies. There's kind of one each 60 year period. So it's, it's more of the, the wet and dry. The other point I would make, and I, it, the graph got way too complicated to show this, but if you plot the, the crosshairs, this is the crosshairs of the first 60 years from 1893 to 1953. If you put the crosshairs on there of the second 60 year period, it's slightly to the right and slightly higher. It's about a half inch in each category, about a half inch more rain in what we call spring and a half inch more rain in the summer. So there has been movement. There is no doubt we have a wetter, and even in the last 60 years, a wetter climate uh, that we're dealing with. This is putting, in one of our crop reporting districts, this is crop reporting district 10, which would be, if I've got my numbering right, this is northwest Iowa. And, and going into this spring, there was a lot of concern whether or not we were going to, because we were so dry, were we going to have a crop failure because of the drought. <coughs> and so we started doing some work on a crop district basis, and we, we looked at, well, what's the yield? That's the blue line over the last about 75 years versus the red line, which is the spring Palmer index, which is a measure of drought. There is no correlation between yields and the drought index in March or April. There's just zero correlation between them. Um, it doesn't matter what that spring is like whether it's wet, whether it's dry, in the long run, it just doesn't correlate. It's not an explanatory variable. When we look at some of the things that farmers are having to do, one is adopting to weather. And we do that through mechanization, through technology, whether it's the size of the equipment, the speed of the equipment, the endurance that we can do with that equipment, the accuracy, genetics, those types of things. I want to take an example of something that, how do farmers adapt? to some of this weather because this year, a wet spring, record amount of unplanted acres, et cetera. So we started looking at, actually it started from a question that uh, Craig Hill, president of Iowa Farm Bureau, happened to text me one day and he said, how many acres got planted in the last hour? Well, being a researcher that reports to him, um, I, I decided I'd answer that question. So we started looking at, well, what, is ha what has happened to planter capacity in this state? Well, the number of planters has declined steadily over the last uh, 40 years or so, but the average size of that planter is going up, and the acres that can be covered per day by each planter is rising. We get the planter speed is slightly going up. We've gone from about four mile an hour average speed of a planter to about five. We've gone from about a four row planter to an average planter out there about 12 rows wide uh, with 16s, 24s, and 48s being out there, et cetera, but the numbers decline. So we look at how many acres of Iowa corn and soybeans planted per week during the favorable, per favorable day because you can't plant when it's raining out. You can't plant if it's not suitable. So in a favorable day, what's happened to our ability to plant? Well, other than about six spikes in 40 years, with the highest one being the worst year we've ever had, 1993, we planted almost the whole state of Iowa in three days. Because that's all you had. So almost everything that got planted got planted in one week in about three days. And guys ran 24 hours a day, etc. The biggest week of planting the state's ever known was 20-some years ago. 
2013 was the biggest week uh, per favorable day that we've had in the last decade. And we planted just a little over 1.5 million acres per day of co combination corn and soybeans in the, on, on per favorable day in the best week we had, in the biggest week of plantings. And we had one week of planting this, this year where we planted 63% of the state's corn got planted in one week this year. So we can move at times. And when we look at the total acres of corn and soy being planted in the biggest week, this was the third biggest one we've ever had. Actually, 2011 was a bigger one than this year. And the biggest week we've ever had was 1993. So we've looked at some of those types of things. And, and we look at how this technology allows us to adapt and adopt those types of things. Because if you don't get the corn planted, you don't really care about harvest. You know, weather in the rest of the year doesn't matter if you can't deal with it in about a three week critical time period. When we've looked at what's happened to acreage, we talk some about land use change. Uh, Iowa corn acres have risen, but we've actually risen our corn acres about right back to where they were in 1980 or 81. We're, we're, we have not substantially increased corn acres in the state. We're about where we were 30 years ago. We have increased soybean acres compared to 30 years ago, but not a lot. And the blue line is CRP acreage. Yes, it's down a little bit. It maxed out just over 2 million acres, and we've got about 1.68, 1.69, someplace in that arena. Where did we, what's happened to land use change? We looked at some land use change over uh, 2006 to 2012 in the face of four, uh, $8 corn for several of those years, the light yellow counties all had an increase in grass acreage. That's good news, Bill. Your watershed up north of you has put in conservation. They've put in grass acres and those types of things. Where did we lose grass in the state? We lost it where we took a third of the county and put it into grass in about a year and a half, two year period in 1986, 87, 88 in that period in the CRP. So it's Ringgold, it's uh, Davis County, it's uh, Lucas, it's Clark, it's the southern state uh, parts of the county. It's probably a bigger issue for the Grand and Sheridan rivers in terms of land use change than it is for the Des Moines Lobe. The Des Moines Lobe, $8 corn has allowed farmers to actually increase conservation stuff that they couldn't probably otherwise do. And so when we look at farmer adaptation to weather, it's adaptive cropping, it's crops with more residue, more conservation tillage, I do all those. It's cover crops. My experience, I participated in the, I was thankful for the state legislature and the, the opportunity to have uh, a cost share on cover crops this year. I participated, I got cost share on 40 acres of cover crops. I planted 310 acres of cover crops. The last 40 acres, it was too cold to plant by the time I got the crop harvested. I did all I could do. I spent 60% of my profit this year to put in a cover crop. Now that's the other economic reality of it. I cost about 30 bucks an acre this year at about 440 corn. You make about $50 an acre. I spent 60% of my net revenue to put in a cover crop. That's not sustainable. Am I committed? Yeah, I'm committed. But how long can you commit 60% of your income to something that probably gives you no return? It's a return to the future generations, but it won't pay my bills next year. Those are the questions that we probably have to really ask. So in concluding, I think we have to be cautious about generalizing about long-term land use from short-term economic conditions. We're gonna see some land use reversion in the face of $4 corn that we didn't see in $8 corn. These things do have, respond to short-term economics. We're gonna see risk management becoming more important and diversification will increase in value across the landscape. But as volatility increases, cash flow decisions become much more uh, important in your investment decisions. What can I afford to invest in? And will cover crops make it to the top of that list? You can't pay for conservation out of losses. If there is no profit in farming, there is no conservation in farming. 
Capital investment horizons are three to 20 years, but my farming career is 20 to 40 years. The climate conditions and those things are millennial. We have to keep in mind that there's differences of what's happening out here. And I, I look forward to the questions. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Okay, hey, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, would anyone like to start? If not, I would like to start with a question about CRP and the land use issue. We've been sort of hearing some conflicting information on the importance of the, I mean, I think nationally it's hundreds of millions of acres that are coming out of CRP, but in Iowa I believe it was about 400,000 acres that are coming out. How important is that and the issue of going fence row to fence row and taking out trees and all of that sort of change in the fragile land? Is that transitional? Is that something that's going to go back with the $4 corn? Um, are there policies that, I mean, again, how much of a problem and do we need to put any policies in to deal with that? I'll take a first whack at that. Uh, one, we hear a lot about all the land coming out of CRP, but in any one year, particularly in Iowa, about half of that goes back into CRP and it's different acres. CRP was designed as a rotational program, not a permanent retirement program. My whole farm was in CRP at one time. It's all marginal ground, right? 170 some bushel an acre of corn this year. Is that marginal? It's above the state average. But I also put 150 some acres into CRP two years ago. When you hear the 400,000 coming out, they're ignoring the 250 or 300,000 that probably went in last year. That's why we don't have this massive reduction in CRP acres. There is a rotation going on in CRP. We had 40 counties in this state that gained grass acres, almost all of that being buffer strips, riparian areas, waterways. I don't hear anybody talking about that. That's a great message. I'd say certainly land use is important um, and uh, that we do see some changes. We've seen some changes. Um, I think it is important to understand those and it's, it's actually quite a challenge to be able to measure those. Um, we, we know a lot more anecdotally than we know um, in actual numbers. You see certainly some land as you've gone past, you've seen some land that was pasture ground or hay ground or maybe it was CRP ground. You probably didn't even know necessarily what it was and the last few years it's been farmed. For the most part in Iowa, we farmed most of the land that's farmable for a long, long time. And the, the changes that we're seeing are significant and they certainly can impact at a local level. When you look at the percentages, if you say CRP land peaked out at 2 million acres and is now 1.7 million acres, 300,000 acres out of 24 million is not insignificant, but it's 1.5% um, or less than 2%. So it's, it certainly has an impact. It has an impact locally. It needs to be managed in a way. And many of those acres that, that have changed are, are even more of a challenge to manage. But we have some practices that folks are using that are much better at managing that land than sometimes when that land was first put in CRP 30 years ago. So we have a lot of no-till. A lot of conservation till we got some folks that are using cover crops especially in southern Iowa where, where they're able to have a longer season they use it sometimes for for hay production as well or for forage production um, so so to generalize it's important it's significant um, but it's but it's still the way we take care of our farm landscapes is going to have it at, at least as much of an impact um, as the small amounts of land changes land use changes there's a couple of questions for Jackie related to sort of the social science behavioral change. And if uh, what types of people do you think need to be involved in these discussions that aren't? And uh, besides the Soil and, Water, uh, Soil and Water Commission, what are other some uh, effective approaches uh, that should be taken or changes that you've seen that might be able to help that? What types of people other than the commissioners need to be involved in the discussion? I, I would say if we're talking about on the local level, uh, 
there should be a stake well a lot of watershed groups will actually bring together different stakeholders um, from their local communities whether they are in the small town or our small city that is in the watershed um, maybe some acreage owners who are not farmers who are living in the rural area who are impacted so all those people need to be at the table we all have an impact but frankly in the state we we all need to be at the table having a discussion because these water quality issues affect all of us um, I like to go to the lakes in the summer and use them and I can tell you Black Hawk Lake where my family has a cabin uh, has a wonderful watershed project going on but they had to because the water was so degraded that you didn't really want to get in it it was so green and the algae and the health risk um, Spirit Lake Lake Okoboji are beginning to show signs of some of these algae blooms that we didn't see in the past so recreation you know the DNR mentioned that earlier so I'd say as citizens we we all need to be taking an active interest in this even if there isn't a watershed project going on and we have to make our voices heard to, um, I guess I can say this because I'm not an elected official or even faculty at Iowa State, <laughs> I'm a program manager, but we've got to use our vote. As urban citizens, raise your hand if you're actually an urban resident. Okay, we are the bulk of the population in the state, and so you're, you, you work with, you act with your vote, you act by becoming involved. You can't just wait and expect that somebody else is going to do it. So th that's how I'm gonna answer that question, is everybody should be involved. You, could, sh you need to do the part that you can do. Um, and don't expect, by the way, I always say this, why do we expect farmers to behave any better or differently than the rest of our general population? How many of you in this room have actually modified your behavior because of extreme weather, because of this carbon issue? I'm still driving my car by far more than I should. I'm still doing these things that I probably could change. It's just a matter of scale. So, you know, everybody needs to be at the table. We all need to be having this as a statewide conversation and not totally leaving it to the local level. I guess that's how I'd answer that. And, and a disclaimer, most of the researchers at the Public Policy Center are social scientists, so we have a little bias there as well. <laughs> yes. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, th those are all very good points. I just want to allow our, our panelists a chance because we're running out of time here to answer. Um, where is the money going to come for, for doing this? It, you know, I... <laughs> <laughs> we're all looking at you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. It's not going to call, it's not going to all come from the state, absolutely, or the federal government. I believe to be able to make these changes the way that we need, we need practices that work for farmers. Um, a lot, awful lot of the conservation activities that farmers use right now, no-till, conservation till, um, are, are practices that were developed in a way that works for producers. I believe we have some of that opportunity in cover crops as well. Cover crops is a cost, absolutely, but as time goes on, I believe that we will realize that there is long-term benefits to erosion control. There can be weed control benefits, certainly for producers with livestock 
on the opportunity to be able to use some of uh, that land or some of that uh, that uh, um, production, that forage that's produced there, I believe we will see folks that will say that's a worthwhile investment. Just like it cost me money uh, to, to buy a planter, that's a worthwhile investment if we can prove that. And I believe that that we're at the very front edge of this. Uh, in Iowa, we've not used cover crops as long as some other states. And certainly in my part of northern Iowa, we've hardly used them at all. Um, I'm up there where, where to get a cover crop established, we got to fly it on uh, in, you know, on Labor Day to be able to have it growing by the time to be able to have it uh, get a little bit of growth in the fall so it can have a good growth in the spring. So I believe the innovation and creativity of the producers figuring out what kind of cover crop, what do we want to, we do want to raise something that, that grows again in the spring or dies off in the winter, that we mix our tillage radishes with our rye or we use oats, other pieces, I think that happens when we get it out there. Now, I don't think government has all those solutions. I don't think all the technicians have all those solutions. And it's different for Iowa than it is for Illinois or Ohio or some of the other states that have even more experience. So I think our job is to get stuff started. We did it with 1,000 farmers. We have 90,000 farmers. That didn't change the water quality dramatically in Iowa. It did in a few small places with a few small folks. Um, we did it on 100,000 acres. You know, sounds great. It's a tiny portion of 24 million acres. But I believe it's the kind of thing that you get started and then we start figuring out the soil quality benefits of this and we work these pieces in a way that we can be more comprehensive than just did my cover crop grow or not and am I satisfying the standard or not. I think we'll see some innovation and creativity that happens from that. Can't predict exactly what that is gonna look like but I'd say every farmer out there is proud of what they're doing, but they want to do a better job next year. And this is one of the ways of saying, here's a way to try something, do something new. Um, and we actually have a lot to learn in all these things. It may seem like a piece of cake, but there's a lot of things that we need to learn and farmers are going to help teach each other um, at, at what we can do as we work with our university extension and others. Yeah, I just want to mention one thing that hasn't been brought up today, um, and it is a technological solution, but wetlands. Um, I don't think the burden of building these wetlands should fall on the landowner if they're willing to do a long-term lease so that once they put one in that it's going to be there and as long as it lasts the way they're constructing them today or for 100 years at least. Um, we get a big bang for the buck with them, especially if they're put in places where they will get the most uh, water so they, they can help clean it. It's nature's way of doing it. Um, and it's a permanent structure, and the money that we put into that in the long term will be well worth it. So educate yourself on these wetlands, a variety of different wetlands, whether it's a restored one that was, is there or a constructed one like the CREP program. Um, the more wetlands we can get back on the land, um, the more we will get just a huge bang for our buck, better than cover crops, better than just about anything for nitrates. I'm going to... I'm sorry to take a little bit more time too, but I, Jackie's point is very important and, and it raises actually several other issues, conflicts over these issues. So we have 70 conservation reserve enhancement CREP program wetlands across Iowa that take tile line water that's generally cleaner than everything except nitrogen. That's where we have our biggest concern of nitrogen. We surface that, that tile line water into these CREP uh, wetlands, we see a 40 to 70 percent reduction in the amount of nitrogen leaving that wetland versus going in. Now these are not cheap, they're permanent, they're, they certainly cost money, it costs money to buy land, it costs money to, to move dirt. One of the things that we have talked about is how do we find ways that private folks are interested in spending some of this money too. We talked a little bit around the tile line issue, we have a lot of tiles in Iowa, about 9 million acres, not, not 90 percent of Iowa, but about 9 million acres that's in tiles around the state, if, and some of those will need to be replaced if they're going to be up to capacity. So we run into this tension of do we have more tiles, especially if we could use some of those folks that want those tiles to build wetlands with private money versus government money. It seems like a good solution but it challenges some of our presumptions on some of these issues. Um, and I think it's a good way of finding private money to do good things that will help them financially, that they can afford to do it, because you have better drained landscape that, that therefore is more productive. But 
you also then have, in some cases, what people don't want is a better drain landscape, um, at least those outside of agriculture. So you have these natural well, tensions. And, and Bill, if you talk to the farmers who have those crep wetlands, they're places of beauty. And yeah. so they get that too. And that, a lot of them, that's the first thing they mention, how much migratory birds they're seeing and all that stuff. So there is so many benefits to wetlands that far exceed mm -hmm. just the water quality. So all the extra money that the DNR has, they'll be happy yeah, yeah. to put yeah. that in and then share those yeah. lands hear, with other people, Chuck, right? Chuck, you hear that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. So the question has to do with a market-based approach versus a regulatory approach to some of these issues. And that's actually worked in some other states for different particular environmental issues. We'd have to adapt it to Iowa, but there is there have been places like Oregon that have started to do some of the, the water quality trading, and maybe we can do something like that here. Um, I think giving people like me, an urban resident, an opportunity to be a part of the solution is going to be part of the solution. So again, it's going to take imagination, creativity, and a willingness to just change how we've always done things. So I think there are opportunities and there are examples in other parts of the, of the country where it's happening. I agree. I think, I think there are challenges as well. So as you look over right. Bill Stowe and say, you know, cost him a million dollars in various expenses to be able to run that nutrient reduction plant, that nitrogen reduction plant, what if he were to spend that money upstream while well, it costs, you know, several billion dollars to be able to affect the water quality and the raccoon and, and the Des Moines River enough to be able to make sure the water he's pulling out of those um, is clean enough that he doesn't have to treat it. So, so we run real challenges because you're treating not just the water that he pulls out of the river, you're treating everything else that goes by. And you're having you know, millions of acres that need to be treated to be able to address that water. So, so there are some places, absolutely, especially in smaller systems where it can be confined and you say you got a small stream feeding a source water for, for a city. Um, we've seen it in the New York cities and others where you got a great demand and small watershed. Um, but in some of ours, it would seem like it's more logical, but it's not super easy to make happen in reality. Okay. With that, please join me in thanking our panel. I think another excellent discussion of the complexity of the issues that we're dealing with. Uh, for the questions that we haven't gotten to, we're going to try to get answers to these and post these on the Public Policy Center website. And again, thank you very much for doing that. Right now, uh, we will have lunch. Uh, we did box lunches, so if we had for 15 minutes, go out into the hallway and grab your lunch. And then we'll be coming in for a talk by Insurance Commissioner Gerhardt.